Okay, so the best kept secret in English rugby is out today. It's official that uh, Steve Borthwick, uh, who's been an assistant to Eddie Jones, has now taken over the head coaching position, assuming the reins, basically, of Eddie Jones. And yesterday, uh, in, in talking to a rugby writer from the UK, he pointed out to me that one thing is for sure, that the English pack next year will be awesome because of this guy and his almost um, addiction to set pieces. He lives, eats, dreams, and sleeps, apparently, lineouts, scrums, and uh, other facets of forward play, and that this is where England are expected to assume uh, some of the dominance that we've seen them for many years, but we'll wait and see. With me now, uh, New Zealand uh, independent rugby journalist, uh, Jamie Wall. Jamie, thank you very much indeed for your time today, and good afternoon to you. So first of all, your thoughts on Borthwick. Do you think the New Zealand Rugby Union can sleep a little easier now, knowing that uh, Robertson's not going to England, or would they be well advised to still be cautious here, because maybe someone else now, another country may well have its eyes set on Robertson um, if England don't want him. Oh, hello, Brendan. Um, great to be talking with you. I don't think they can ever really sleep easy on, on Scott Robertson, um, no matter what, what the situation, because um, if he is going to stay in New Zealand, that's just another headline every week that they, they have to deal with as to why he's not coaching coaching the All Blacks. Uh, and we're going to get it all through Super Rugby because I think we all know that the Crusaders are going to go through and dominate like like they usually do. Uh, and there's going to be questions about how a guy who can who has that level of success with a team that contains so many All Blacks in it uh, isn't getting a, isn't getting a look in. So it's even though they have kind of put a full stop on the narrative uh, last year by by putting their their support behind uh, Foster through to the end of the World Cup and then leaving that door open uh, no matter what happens, which is a strange kind of situation that we have. Uh, the, the people are still going to going to talk about it, and yeah, you mentioned that um, there is a possibility of coaching uh, other nations um, next year. There's there's always going to be a job open for him, you know, if if he if he puts his hand up. Obviously, Wales uh, don't ha- have uh, a locked in head coach from next year on, so that would um, be potentially where where uh, uh, sorry sorry not Wales. Um, what am I talking about? Because uh, they've got they've got Gatlin back, but uh, uh, the Wallabies rather uh, might be in a position where they might want to replace um, Dave Rennie, and so you know there's always going to be that threat um, there. And if he was, uh, if Scott Robertson did decide to um, jump over the ditch, we're going to have a situation that you and I are both both remember pretty well of when Robbie Deans um, did the same thing and took a lot of. Uh, goodwill that existed uh, in the New Zealand rugby community with him um, over there. It uh, didn't end up being um, quite the fairy tale that Robbie Deans probably uh, wanted, um, but it is kind of feeling like it's going to play out in a, in a similar uh, sort of situation. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's in, instead of being um, the uh, full stop on the story that NZ Rugby wanted uh, around Scott Robertson, we're going to be seeing um, more of that... Uh, more of that sort of conversation keep going as long as he's there. Yeah, but I suppose realistically, Jamie, there's a, really, I would have thought, only probably maybe two countries uh, that could afford, I suppose, the market value that uh, Robertson can command. I mean, as you mentioned, Wales have taken care of, England's been taken care of, South Africa I don't think would entertain just yet a foreigner coaching the Springboks. Ireland have got uh, Andy Farrell, who's doing a very good job, as we saw in New Zealand this year. So that really leaves, I would have thought, only Scotland, Australia and Japan. Well, Japan have got Joseph and Brown, and they're doing an excellent job there, and they're getting well paid, I'm sure, the sort of money that probably uh, Robertson could command. You've mentioned Australia. Well, Eddie Jones has been talking to the um, president of the Australian Rugby Union, this fellow uh, Hamish McLennan, I think his name is, uh, over the last week about an informal kind of arrangement for him to come back to Australian rugby. And that leaves Scotland. And, uh, yeah, Scotland, I suppose, would appeal because, in a way, there's a almost like a sparring match going on still, isn't there, between Robertson and the New Zealand Rugby Union from a distance. Uh, Robertson is saying... Uh, that he wants to coach an overseas side and he'd love to coach them and beat the All Blacks. 
So I think he's telling the New Zealand Rugby Union, don't just sit back and think I'm waiting here for my phone to ring after the Rugby World Cup at the end of next year. So uh, it's going to be a cat and mouse sort of game, isn't it, up until that Rugby World Cup next year or until its completion? Absolutely. And, I mean, you know, for the public and for the media, it's great uh, because um, Scott Robinson is definitely not shy of uh, putting putting his thoughts out there. Uh, however clouded they might be in, in, in um, you know, sort of the sort of speak he likes to he likes to put out there. But I I think that I, I'd be surprised if he ended up in a place like Scotland. Um, we one thing we have seen uh, in the last, last well the last few weeks, but also the last few years is just how volatile the coaching situations are in some of these some of these places. So I think that. Uh, you know, if the opportunity came up, or if he was to approach any any place, really, the, the you know the the possibilities are there. Because I don't think a couple of weeks ago any of us thought Eddie Jones was going to lose his job, um, and he, and they did. They they finally sort of pulled the trigger on him after a really up and down um, tenure, which had some really decent highs, um, but some quite quite well yeah he had, well, a te- so. had a terrible year this year didn't you look at the record i think they only won about yeah, four but, or five but, test but matches go, but if you go back to uh 2017 you know that he, he guided them to uh, i think it was 18 test wins in a row hmm. and and then um and then the next year they they bottomed out they lost a series in south africa and then came back to make the world cup final and beat the all blacks in a, in a semi-final so i mean the success the successes were there uh, so I don't think he's going to be necessarily out of a job for too long. One sort of outsider thing, you know, I, I don't necessarily think this would happen, but I think it's definitely worth mm. entertaining is um, that the U- United States are going to be hosting a World Cup um, in uh, 2027, and they're going to need a lot of help to get them to be, you know, because, because they, they haven't even qualified um, for next year's World Cup. Uh, and so if they can finally actually tap into the sort of money that they've been talking about exists in, within the, the United States uh, sports system um, for as long as we can possibly remember, and I think that hosting this World Cup is going to actually do that for them, um, then you know there's a gig there for an Eddie Jones or a Scott Robertson to, to perhaps have a look at. Mm, interesting. Uh, OK, let, let's just talk about a few other things. I suppose we're all probably sick and tired of talking about Robertson and Foster, Robertson and Foster, and, and the, the Rugby World Cup. And somewhere in the middle of all of this is Gatlin and Jones. Um, tell me about what it's been like covering the All Blacks this year on the road, in particular. Are they uh, an easy team to work with from a journalistic point of view? Uh, no, they're not. Um, I don't think that it comes as any surprise, you know, especially someone like yourself, Brendan. Mm. Um, no, and this this year has been a very, very interesting year with them. Um, it's the first time in a while where they've had to uh, deal with the sort of scrutiny at home um, because if, you know, while the All Blacks lose games, big games every now and then, and and that it's generally been offshore and you have it, there's a whole different vibe when you're covering them overseas. Um, you're generally a little bit closer to the team and you can get a bit of stuff that's sort of, um, off the record, you know, to give a bit of context as to why they might have lost or played the way that they did. Um, this has all been a, the, the the start of the year. Obviously, the series lost to Ireland, which was something that you know a lot of people going into the season had sort of earmarked as like, man, this is a really tough start to the season. You got three tests against Ireland and two against South Africa, and I can't see the All Blacks possibly winning all of them. And then to lose the series, um, especially in the way that they did, um, just turn the heat up big time and um, obviously we had that press conference that never happened on um, after the, the loss in Wellington and that just kind of set the tone for the rest of the year because they never really made up for that in a way there was never any sort of sit down and go like okay you know like hey we're sorry like we kind of dropped the ball on that but and we're going to do better from it. it they very much just stuck to what they were um uh, you know the absolute minimum obligation that they they have to give, which is you know three press conferences a week and a captain's run, which is generally just not even worth turning up to. Uh, and Ian Foster himself was incredibly defensive um, for most of the year, which you could obviously expect. Uh, but even just little things like body language, you know, just not greeting the, the the media. I'm not saying that you know we deserve special treatment or anything like that, but at least to kind of establish some sort of friendly relationship so that when things do start to go awry 
you know, there's there's that connection in the back of our minds to go like, okay, well, at least I'm going to kind of perhaps try and explain why this is happening instead of just going like, this is unacceptable, because that's what we were writing, you know, when this... Uh, when those losses um, started happening, do you feel um, do you, do you feel compromised at times when you are having to do a piece that's inherently going to be inevitably critical of say Foster and the All Blacks because they just lost uh, to someone like Ireland, or uh, are you in a situation where you think, oh no, I better not put the boot, <coughs> excuse me, better not put the boot into him too much because he'll never talk to me again. Do you feel ever compromised in, in your job? No, not not at all. Because I I think that you know he he is still the All Black coach. He's still the most high pro. It's the most high profile spot in New Zealand sport, and so he has to he has to talk. You know, he, there's no way he can get away from it. And and if he doesn't want to talk to me personally, I'm going to be able to talk to him in a press conference. You know, whether that's during the week or before or after a game. And uh, like honestly, it, it's if he. My my take on the whole thing is that I don't think he really understands that establishing some sort of relationship, like a working relationship um, with the media, uh, is that important. Um, he he re- definitely doesn't command the the room like a Steve Hansen or a Graham Henry um, does, uh, and it's made the All Blacks kind of feel like a real closed shop um, at the moment. And there's no there's very little connection that comes through uh, in the media at the moment there's very little to connect the all blacks to the people that they're representing and you know we've heard it a lot um ever since the world cup um but the way that the black ferns uh conducted themselves and i i think like win lose or draw we'd still be saying this about about the the black ferns like no matter what happened in that that world cup uh because i think that the way that they conducted themselves the way that the friendliness the openness uh made new zealanders really cling on to that team and that was why there was 40,000 people at Eden Park for a women's rugby match. And, you know, tell if I, if I told you, hey, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, well, there'd even, be a even, women's match even, that even, would have filled up Eden Park. Even you know? five years ago. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, and, and that was done by the team simply connecting itself to the public. And I think it's something the All Blacks have really lost sight of uh, in the last couple of years. Um, you know, it's always been a guarded, you know, um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Around, around, it always, it always has been. But I think that the walls have gone up just that much further um, you know, since the mm. results have been, uh, the results haven't been in their favour. Because I suppose one of the sad things, and just from my observation, uh, having dealt with Ian Foster over many years, in fact, he used to work for it, uh, TVNZ uh, as a salesman um, many years ago, and so uh, I've always found him a very easygoing, relaxed kind of guy, and so I've. And I've been intrigued to see whether that kind of aspect of his personality, his character, has changed uh, with the criticism he's been copying this year. And by the sound of what you've just told me, that he has, he's not quite the open, easygoing guy that he might have been before he was the All Black coach. Well, that's that's the thing, is that, um, you know, we obviously covered the team for a, for a few years now, and when he was assistant coach, it was... Um, he was very approachable, you know, very friendly guy, and I always got along with him. I still do feel that kind of connection um, with him, but I think that a lot of the critique um, that's been levelled at the team has been taken very personally, not just by the coaching staff, but not just by the players, but the entire kind of group uh, has had this kind of closed shop mentality that I mentioned before, and it feels like any sort of criticism uh, is invalid. And that's... Mm, mm when you're covering sport, it's just simply uh, unfair because it's like, well, you lost the game. We have to find a reason why. Mm. You know, you've shown it to, you've shown it to us. There's, no, there's nothing personal about us saying, like, you played badly because you did, and you know that. Like, you have these team meetings on Monday mornings or Tuesday mornings or whatever where you sit in a circle and you admit that to each other. So I don't know why we can't say it as well. Yeah, I think what you're not taking on board, though, is this basic human condition that we all suffer from, that no one likes being criticised. You don't like being criticised um, for your work um, any more, I suppose, than the All Blacks like being criticised for their work, even if they've had a bad day. And so there's always going to be that kind of tension there that... Um, uh, because you kind of, it's a, they take it personally because you've criticised them. Um, but, um, you know, and it's a very hard thing, I suppose, for sportsmen, not just for All Blacks, but you see it everywhere in the world. 
I imagine you know the French team are copying a bit of criticism at the moment for the way they played yesterday against Argentina, even though I, they could have won the match. But uh, so I can kind of understand st- st- where the All, all Blacks are coming from, but uh, I'm not sure what the solution is. Well, I agree with you to a point um, in that you know some criticism crosses the line, and I think that a lot of what professional sportsmen have to deal with these days is really unfair social media criticism from just Joe Public, and a lot of that is really unwarranted, you know, where you're getting personal and, and, and that. And I think that a lot of professional sports people conflate that with the people in the actual media who are paid to do it. But really, it, it does kind of go back to what I was saying before about representation. And it's like, when it really comes down to it, the All Blacks aren't really getting paid to play rugby. They're getting paid for to represent the country and they're getting paid for the scrutiny that comes with it. Otherwise, they can come play on my team on, on the weekends. And, um, you know... It, it's good fun. Um, you, you're going to suffer the same sort of injuries. Uh, uh, you're going to feel good when you score a try, but you're not getting paid for it, and no one's mm. going to watch. And that's why that's why people show up and watch. It's because of the headlines and because of the uh, the hype that's built around it by people like you and I. Yeah, it's interesting. There was a, a English rugby writer, a prominent one, probably before your time, although his son is now writing and lives, I think, here in New Zealand, called John Reason, who was a very sort of sur, sur, um, surly, almost bitter kind of rugby writer towards New Zealand. And... Uh, I, di- I didn't know him well, but I had some you know, occasional interactions with him um, when he was here or f- if I was in the UK on, on some sort of rugby exercise. And he once told me and a couple of other Kiwi journalists that he never goes to press conferences after a game, he said, because um, the reader... In this case, the reader of his newspapers don't care um, to hear and want to read about excuses coming from players, captains and coaches for losing a game. What they want to read is what my opinion as the rugby writer for this paper is. So I never go to press conferences after the game and for the same reason I don't go to them when they win because it's all PR waffle that comes out of their mouths. And I thought, oh God, that's a very kind of stunted view of your job. But in some ways I can kind of, as I've been in this job you know, over the years, I can kind of come around to his point of view. What's the point of even going to some of these press conferences after, say, the All Blacks lose a match? Because you're not going to get anything, well, I, are you? No, I, I absolutely agree. It's um, uh, with with some of it, like some of the midweek ones are just absolutely worthless. Uh, anything with an assistant coach has generally um, been very boring. Uh, Jason Ryan, on the other hand, has has actually been been pretty mm, decent. I mean, because yeah. they're not going to tell you they're not going to tell you anything uh, at all that's um, uh, going to give anything away and. Uh, most of the players themselves are kind of not just kind of in the dark about what's going on anyway, because there's no point asking a guy like, oh, do you think you'll get selected this week? Because he's got no control over that. Yeah. Uh, but also the fact that most of them are just young young men who have only ever really gone to rugby practice and played games, and that's it. Mm. There's not really much more uh, to them. So I kind of go along with that. In saying that, though, I definitely think it's worth uh, attending the press conferences after they after they lose, after the All Blacks lose, um, because if nothing else, then just to read the uh, the sort of body language yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that comes out of that, and and how and how those guys might be mentally processing uh, what's going on. Mm. But yeah, you're you're right. Like I don't generally tend to quote guys um, post match because it's just always the same thing. Yeah, you're is. always going to get. Um, and finally, in, in, in one or two words, uh, how far will the All Blacks go at next year's Rugby World Cup? Uh, I can see them winning it, and I can see them ducking out in the quarterfinals. Uh, it's, it's that open at the moment. Uh, and, and if you look at the last World Cup, and you see how South Africa won it uh, with a healthy dose of luck, uh, that luck might fall the All Blacks' way this time, and uh, they might end up on the right side of the draw. Hope you're right, Jamie. Jamie Wall, I thank you very much indeed. Rugby writer with us here this afternoon on the platform. Thank you, Jamie, and you have a nice Christmas. Cheers, Brendan. You too.